Good morning, everyone. So in the midst of all the comings of goings of summer, I'm coming. Uh, I was gone, and it's great to be back with you. And I'm glad you're here. I hope you're glad to be here. And uh, somebody said, uh, in the, one of the band members said, you know, summer is that crazy time where everyone runs around trying to find peace, right? We hurry around. But I hope you're finding peace, and I hope you're uh, finding some rest this summer. You know, we uh, are here above all to, to meet our wonderful Lord and Savior. I want to welcome uh, everyone who's watching online and welcome you, especially if you're here for the first time, a warm, warm welcome to you. I think it's a, a good thing as we begin our worship service to remind ourselves of why we're here. Uh, we all are seeking something, right? We come here for a reason. We come here with, with some hopes, but it's really important for us to remind ourselves that someone else is seeking something, and that's, that trumps all of the things we're seeking, and that is God. Uh, Jesus said this, a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. These are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So God is looking into your heart, he's looking into mine, and he's seeking a certain type of worshiper, uh, the person who is utterly uh, sincere and open before him, uh, the person who comes to him on the level of complete truth about themselves and him, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And with that, would you stand with me, please? I love that verse in Psalm 95 uh, that says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. God's inviting us into His presence. What a wonderful thing. Let's take a moment and allow me to pray for us. Father in heaven, uh, thank you, thank you, wonderful, awesome God, that you, the mighty God of the universe, are opening your arms and saying, come into my presence, worship me, know that you are the people of my pasture, the flock under my care. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And, and allow me to greet you in his name. Grace to you, everyone, and peace. Uh, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment to just say hello to one another. As you all slowly find your way back to your seats, I invite you guys, as you're able to, remain standing as we sing. We've got four songs prepared. We were waiting without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Oh 
So children for the month of August are not being dismissed. There's child care in the, the kids corner for up to ages four. But what we have done is we've set up some stations. There are some in the back where we normally allow space for flagging. Uh, we've set up some stations where parents can be with their kids. And we do ask that parents be with their kids. But they're also in front of the TVs out in the foyer if you have children who are older than four. And then in September, we'll, we will resume our normal programming. It is our privilege to come before this great God that we've been singing about and talking about uh, each, each week. Uh, God, in his profound mercy, uh, it welcomes us to come uh, as a church together into his presence. And uh, we, wanna, we wanna do that. And what I'm going to be doing is just so this can be something that we really engage in and do thoughtfully um, and not my, uh, my, mindlessly as you know we can, as I, I admit I can, I could let my mind wander, but we're coming before the great God and we, we wanna focus on him. And, uh, and so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be allowing pauses along the way, just simply for you to, in your own heart, to say what you need to say to God. Now, I do want to extend one word of congratulations before we start. Unfortunately, we do not have a wedding picture. We have only this picture. But these two folks were married yesterday. Um, so this is Calvin and Ashley Riarda, and we just... Uh, extend our warmest congratulations to them, and uh, we want to pray for them as well. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come before the creator of the trillions and trillions of galaxies, each one that would dwarf us in ways unimaginable, and yet for you, these are but merely the breath of your mouth. And we come before you, God, who is loving and gracious beyond anything we can conceive of through your Son, Jesus, who made a way for us to come into your presence. And now, Lord, each of us in the quiet of our own heart takes time to just praise you for who you are. Father in heaven, we come to you as broken people. And this week, we're not proud of times where we've, we've just lost it with people, lost it with our children, times of really not liking what's been going on in our mind and heart, and, and then there are all of the things we don't even know we've done or we've left undone, and in this moment of quiet, we come before you and we confess, and we ask for your cleansing. And thank you that, Lord, you've made a way through Jesus and his death on the cross that we could know were received by you. But now, Lord, we also do come. We come as broken people. We come with people who have needs. Um, some of us are, are, are dealing with uh, relationships that are strained. Uh, we're dealing with financial things. We're dealing with things that may not make the six o'clock news, and, and maybe we wouldn't even talk to others about them, but we could talk to you. And so in this moment of quiet, just hear us as we cry out to you for ourselves and for those we love whom we know are hurting.
God, we know our world is broken. Um, wars are blazing all over the world. Glorify your name on this earth and bring the remedy, which is the gospel. Father, we pray for Jessica Wiarda, who was hit by a truck and uh, had surgery this past Friday. Please not only heal her body, but hold on to her heart as she goes through this very perplexing time. Thank you, Lord, for Calvin and Ashley and their wedding. You know, it's so wonderful that amid the difficult things, there are always these instances of grace, and this is a new beginning and a new commitment to you when we pray that your blessing would rest on Calvin and Ashley, that they, theirs would be a deepening unity. And Father, we thank you that Eve Kugel will celebrate 91 years this year. Father, in, in a moment, we're going to come before your word. And we, we want to receive it. We want to hear it and we want to receive it. But not more than you want us to get it. Uh, you're not the barrier, we, we are. And so we pray that when we open your word, you would give us the heart and the mind to receive it because it is your love that we would know you and how to trust and follow you in this world for our own good. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a video that we're going to watch, Divorce Care. We have many programs uh, starting uh, up, and one of them is Divorce Care, um, talking about ministries, about healing. Let's watch this video, and then Liz Isis, one of the leaders of that program, is going to come and talk to us a little bit about Divorce Care. People close to you are struggling with the hurt of separation and divorce. You feel at a loss, not sure how to help. That's why we want you to know about Divorce Care. Divorce Care is a video-based small group for people who are divorced or separated. I found rest at Divorce Care. I found the help I needed at Divorce Care. Divorce Care kept me from making decisions that I'd later regret. Divorce Care helped me find relief. I learned to forgive at Divorce Care. So how can you encourage your friend or family member to join a divorce care group? Give them a divorce care brochure or flyer. Send your friend a link to the divorce care website. Personally, tell your friend or family member about divorce care or promote divorce care in your community using web, print, and radio ads. Guide someone to help, hope, and healing from the pain of divorce. Tell someone about Divorce Care today. Liz and Adrian Isis. Adrian Isis is going to be doing the talking. Um, so Divorce Care is a safe place where caring people come alongside you as they find healing from pain and of separation of divorce. At this 13-week video-based support group program, you'll find helpful counsel to manage the emotional turmoil and practical tools for decision-making. Divorce Care is a Christ-centered, biblical-based program that helps those who have been devastated by, by divorce or separation. This course affirms the sanctity of marriage while acknowledging that God permits divorce in certain circumstances. We are asking that you consider inviting a friend or family member or coming yourself if you find yourself separated or divorced. Our new season will be starting on Tuesday evenings, starting on September 10th, and they will run till December 10th. Um, we will be running them from 6.30 to 8.30 in the evening. If you would like any more information, you can talk to myself or Liz or Mike or Janet Steiginga. Um, on another note, We've just seen so much um, good come from this program in the two, two sessions that we've run in the last year. Um, we've had people that have gone through the course who've just been inspired to want to lead to themselves because they felt so convicted. One of them in particular I could think of was even a little uh, reluctant to even join and now really feels that 
they want to they want to help lead. So, mm-hmm. if we a lot of us know people that have gone through or are going through difficult relationship issues like this, and please uh, reach out to them and uh, send them our way. Thank you. Um, you know, it's an what an amazing program. So many people have found healing, and thank you for what you do. And thanks, uh, Janet and Mike. Um, they talked about uh, flyers that we could uh, pass out and stuff. If we wanted to uh, give people information about divorce care or invite them, what's the best thing? Send them to our website, or do you have things we There's pass things them? things at the Welcome Desk. Right at the Welcome Desk. Yeah, so Welcome Desk. And, and uh, if you look divorce care up online, it'll lead you right to our, our church website, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Oh, and Liz, you, yeah, you can have your Bible back. <laughs> oh, it's Annabelle. <laughs> Very good. Uh, just last thing before we go to God's word, and that is uh, that it is our privilege to be able to support the ministry of uh, Maranatha Church to give back a little bit of all that God has given to us. And I just want to encourage everybody, especially in the summertime, to be faithful with your offerings. And our second offering is for local Christian education to support those who cannot afford to send their children uh, to Christian Ed without some help. You can give online, give using the debit machine, give uh, in the box that's right there at the doors as you leave, or sign up for monthly withdrawals. Now, today we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 6, and it's, uh, we're beginning a new series. It's just four messages long. And it's called Encountering God. And uh, the, the point of this ser- uh, series is that we're going to be stopping in on the lives of four people in the Bible who experienced God, uh, sometimes in profound ways, sometimes in unexpected ways. But the idea is that we just want to get a picture of this wonderful God we serve because nothing's more important than knowing God. There could be no greater gift. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And today we're, we're looking at certainly one of the most profound God encounters, and that's the one that Isaiah had with God when he was in the temple worshiping one day. And I'm going to be reading uh, Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. You can follow on the screen or on your phones or... As we've dis- discovered, there's about one Bible in this whole, uh, whole <laughs> auditorium, or maybe a few, but we tend to go uh, digital. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Now this is where a lot of times uh, pastors will stop reading right at that point. But the chapter goes on, and what it goes on to say is pretty vital for our understanding of the the text. And uh, he said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding be ever seeing but never perceiving, make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And I said, for how long, Lord? 
And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. And that's as far as we're going to read in God's word. So I want to ask you today, what is your greatest need right now in this moment as you sit here? Um, that could be a difficulty you're facing. Uh, that could be a, a, a challenge you have. That, that could be a goal you have, but you have needs around this goal. What is that need? Or let me put it another way. If you could have an audience with God and you could have just a couple of minutes with God and say, God, I need this one thing from you. I need you to change this one thing in my life. That's what I need. What would you say to God in, in, in that audience? So think about that. You got that in your mind, what that thing is or what that cluster of things are? Okay, now what if I suggested to you that whatever it was that came to mind as your biggest need is not, in fact, what you need most in your life. What if the change you need at this time in your life is not a change in your circumstances, but a change in you? Because you see, this is what this passage is all about. Uh, Isaiah undergoes a soul upheaval, and he experiences a change in him. And what he experienced and what we need more than our physical needs, our, our, our resource needs, is the change that happens when we understand who God is, and we understand who we are in relationship to God, and then we look at the world and realize I'm facing maybe the same problems the same challenges, the hope, same hopes, the same dreams, but somehow I'm looking at this in a completely and utterly different light, a more hopeful way of looking at things. And so if you're willing to believe, if you're willing to just uh, grant that premise for one minute that maybe what you think you need most in this world isn't what you need, but what you need is God, then follow me as we go into this passage and we discover what Isaiah discovered about God and then we consider the changes that we need to undergo to adjust our whole life around that understanding. So our passage begins like this. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. So, okay, in the year King Uzziah died, Uzziah had reigned in Israel or in Judah for 52 years. Now, you should hear in these words, the year King Uzziah died, the word anxiety. So 52 years of good leadership. The, the country was prosperous. His, his leadership is the best leadership that this country has had until since King David had been the king and things had been going along so well in the country, and now power is going to pass from, uh, from him, Uzziah, to a 25-year-old boy, young man. And it's a nervous time. You know, Janet and I went through the United States, and they're a little bit nervous about an upcoming election. Half the nation's... Uh, nervous about one person getting in and the other half is uh, worried about the other person in and there, there, there are feelings of catastrophe depending on who you are. You know, it's interesting. Uh, there are actually movements in the states to succeed from the United States. Texas has one, California has one, Hawaii, New Hampshire, <laughs> that little state. There's anxiety, and we don't have to do much to, to feel the anxiety that is in the world. This is a time of anxiety, and what God says to Isaiah in this moment is that what you need to know right now, Isaiah, 
is that Uzziah is not the king. No human ruler is the king, but the person on the throne of the universe, the person, the one who is ultimately in charge of this cosmos is God. And then the passage goes on and it says, and the, the train of his robe filled the temple. What's, what, well, what's the significance of that? Well, when we think of royalty, a way of expressing the majesty of the, the monarch is that they would have uh, a long train on their robe. So in 1953, at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, isn't that regal? You see her seated on her throne, and you see this train flowing from her throne. And yeah, here's another pic. This is how long it was. When she walked down the aisle, it took four pages to carry this incredibly long train. Your office is regal. Your office is majestic. But now, this is what Isaiah is saying. God was seated on the throne in this vision he had in the temple, and God's train went from here to over here to back to here to over there to over there to over there to over there and over there, and it filled this massive temple. And Isaiah, obviously, as a result of that, could get no closer to God to to the one on the throne than the hem of his garment. Such is the royalty, the majesty of God. And then the passage goes on and it says this, above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, these seraphim appear only here in the Bible. Uh, Their name means fiery ones. Uh, They're obviously these angels of enormous power whom God has created. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Now, in the Bible, uh, often, or at least sometimes, when they want to emphasize something, they want to intensify it, they will repeat the word in Hebrew. So, for example, in Genesis chapter 14, verse 10, uh, the author is talking about this retreating army falling into these, these tar pits. And he's trying to describe how awful they are. And he, in Hebrew, it literally just says, and they fell into the pit pits. Like, like these are really pity pits. Like, pity, pity pits, right? And, and then in Kings, uh, 2 Kings 25, 15, when it wants to talk about the purest gold, it doesn't say pure gold as the NIV translates it to make it sense for it, but it says gold, gold. And do you remember the older translations of the Bible, which would quote Jesus as saying, truly, truly, Jesus was using this, this Hebrew way of thinking to say, this is true truth, this is absolute truth that I'm speaking to you. But nowhere in the Bible, anywhere, has a characteristic of God been raised to the third degree, repeated three times, except here in Scripture, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. He is holy beyond category for holiness. And that's a matter of fact what holiness actually means, that that God is beyond categories. Everything he is, his, his character, every aspect of his being is beyond anything created, beyond anything we could imagine. But this word holiness also has the idea that God is worthy of worship. That God is beautiful in his his glory. 
These seraphim are, 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 are enraptured and they, they cover their eyes because the glory of God is, is too much for them. But they are wholly engaged in the beauty and they're crying out to God. Worship the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The splendor, excuse me, of his holiness, says, says the Bible. Now, we need this view of God, which truly is a shock when we let it sink in. Somebody said this, they said in the old days, uh, we used to have a, a view of the high God, right? So in the Bible, the Bible paints a picture of the high God. But then somewhere in our society, God became the high God. Uh, that he became our, our buddy. And I, I just want to say that this is really a very serious thing for people like us. This is a big temptation because people who take the Bible seriously in our culture, we really stress that we need a personal relationship with God. We really stress the love of God, and that's all well and good. But sometimes we get to the place where we, we, we so lower him That, that, that love, the love of God means, means nothing anymore. I mean, it becomes complete, a complete abstraction apart from this reality of God. But what's worse is in our society, we, we've moved to something else, and that is now God is the handy God. That it's handy if you're starting a business or if you're pursuing a big goal or if you have a problem, God is handy. Uh... And he's there, right? That's his job, to help us out. Uh, God will forgive, that is his job, said one philosopher on his deathbed. You know, I, I think uh, Janet and I have started this uh, new uh, hobby of feeding birds. And uh, so this is how it goes. I've been feeding these birds quite faithfully. And it goes like this. The birds all come and sit on the trees and the bird feeder. We're a very popular house in the neighborhood. Nobody else is doing this, I guess. And they all kind of hover, and they're on our deck, and they're just waiting. And then I come, boom, they, they disappear. And then uh, this man, the source of their beneficence, I pour out all of this seed, and then J I, Janet and I sit on our deck, no birds. Maybe one or two, you know, dare. Uh, and then we go in the house, and then they all flock. Uh, they're not interested in a personal relationship, I've discovered. And... Uh, and so, really, if they could have a universe in which they had all the gravy train come in and didn't have me in it, that would be their ideal universe, really. But unfortunately, this is, the Bible says, how we relate to God. Uh, we want, we tend to want what he gives. But our hearts can be very slow to really love him and relate to him. And this is what Isaiah sees about God. He, he's going to experience a complete upheaval in his soul. And I'd like to suggest that this upheaval is what you and I need today. More than the solution to any of our problems, we need this today. Tim Keller describes what Isaiah underwent as a self-quake. So... What, what he means by that is this, that when a power, with something more massive than another thing falls on it or hits it, it causes a quake. So uh, the two plates in the earth shift, and we have an earthquake. Uh, a truck goes over a bridge that maybe is really not designed for trucks, and you're on that bridge, and you feel it shaking, and you're experiencing a bridge quake. A massive rock falls on the ice of a lake, and you're on that ice, and you feel an ice quake, or a water quake, if, there's, if it's liquid water. Well, what Isaiah experienced was a self-quake. He experienced the glory of God. He saw the glory of God, and the glory of God literally means the weight of God, 
He came before God and he saw the substantiality of God and his own being in in relationship to it is so insubstantial. You know, it's such a joke that people say, well, I don't believe in God or I don't know if I believe in God. I mean, if, if, if we could have a moment like this that Isaiah had, you know, he probably said, do I believe in myself? I mean, I am so insubstantial. This is reality right here. And he had this soul quake, and and this soul quake went in two directions. The first is that he he became reoriented. He he became reoriented to the supremacy of God in his life. You know, we we, we imagine that, that God exists and will somehow fit in our goals or, or he'll fit into our goals, and he'll fit into uh, our problems. And, and it's just so ludicrous. We live in this, this universe that is beyond imagining how big it is and how many trillions of stars and galaxies there are. And we want to call the Almighty to be our assistant. And Isaiah undergoes a complete reversal where it's like, no, no, God is not going to fit into my plans. This is how it goes. And we read, we read these words. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. The words here am I in Hebrew, it's kind of a famous Hebrew expression, it's hineni, it means I am completely here, I am completely present to you. Sometimes God says it to humans, but it's often something a servant would say to a master. It's something Abraham says to God, and and, and Samuel says to God, here am I. And now Isaiah's response to God is to say, God, here am I. I don't even know what you're going to do. You want someone to do something, and I don't even know what it is. But whatever it is, here am I. As it turns out, it's a preacher's worst nightmare. You're going to go and preach, and nobody's going to listen to you. And you're going to preach your heart out, and they're just going to reject you. And I want you to do this for the rest of your life. And as Isaiah is like, I don't care what it is. I just want to be like these seraphim in your presence, enraptured with your beauty and, and serving you. I, you are the center. I orient myself around you. That's how this goes. That's how the universe is designed. And then Isaiah reorients himself in a second way, and that is this. He reorients himself to God's grace. Now look at those words in verse 5. He says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah proclaims a woe on himself. So what does the word woe mean? Well, if a prophet says, woe to you, such and such a nation, well, it means it's curtains for you. Or at least it means if you do not change your behavior, if you do not turn from your way, it is curtains, it is through, it is destruction for you. And now here is Isaiah in the presence of this glory of God uh, before which the angels, these most powerful beings, have to hide their eyes And he's saying, God, woe to me. I am ruined. I am facing the absolute destruction of my being, the dissolution of myself. I do not have the capacity to live another second with this reality, given who I am. He said, uh, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Uh, Isn't it interesting that as he's being anointed to be a prophet, he he realizes that his lips, his words are impure, are, uh, you know, are, are just, they're full of lies and flattery and all of the things we fill our speech with. Jesus said that every idle word we speak, we will stand before the, the throne of God and we'll go through that. And we'll see how much of our speech was actually true, sincere to what we actually believed, how much of it was flattery, uh, you know, and, and on and on it goes. And he, and he realizes that he's just crushed. And, 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 you know, God hasn't given him the business. God is just showing him the truth. Uh, Mark Twain said this, everyone is a moon 
and has a dark side which he never shows to anybody. You know, humans have a light side. We're created in the image of God. We reflect the glory of God. But we have a dark side we don't like to talk about. We certainly don't like to show it to anybody. But we all know it's there. And sometimes we do a good job of even hiding it from ourselves. And really, I think in the mercy of God, he lets us do that to some extent. There was Isaiah before this experience, living in ignorant bliss. But sometimes God lets us feel the full weight of the reality of who we are, and we realize that we are more cruel than we dared believe, we are more petty than we dared believe, we are potentially more jealous and envious than we dared believe. But in this moment of utter, utter assured destruction, we're told that one of the seraphim comes to him with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And we know that altar, the ultimate place of that altar, the ultimate place where God made forgiveness possible was the altar of the cross of Jesus. And so simultaneously with knowing that he's, uh, given who he is, just deserves this utter destruction, he, he now realizes that he's utterly and profoundly loved, not because of who he is or what he's done, but because of who God is. He sees this about God. And, and, and these are the qualifications. Now he's being sent out to his people. You see what God has done. He says, I want you to know how vast and how big I am because you'll need that as you go talk to these people. But I also want you to be someone who has no high thoughts about himself and preaching out there in self-righteousness. I want you to be a humble prophet proclaiming to my nation my word, my love, my promises, my warnings. And that's, of course, how we need to be too. And so, what we need today is we need a soul quake. We need to completely reorient ourselves to our, our issues and our lives. And that will be good for us. I just want to say one thing. As I said, you know, uh, when I was reading this passage, there's one place where preachers tend to stop in this passage, but I want to push on and just very briefly look because at the rest of the chapter, because I believe in the rest of the chapter there is a tiny little step forward we could take as we pray to God for a reorientation of our heart. Verses 9 and 10 said, He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving, make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull and close their eyes, Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And it, it almost sounds like God is saying, I just want you to go out there and you just make things worse for my people. You just go harden their hearts. But that's not what God is saying. God has invited Isaiah to experience his heart. And as we know from reading Isaiah, he's going to proclaim God's love and God's invitation and God's willingness to forgive, and he's going to proclaim promises and truth and warning. And this is what's going to happen. The people are going to mock. And what happens, you go to Isaiah 25, and I'm going to give a brief paraphrase, but the leaders, the priests, and the leaders of the people, they hear Isaiah, and they go, man, this is kindergarten stuff you're telling us. We know the nuances of the law, and you come at us with this kindergarten stuff. But they're not obeying it, of course. They, they nuance it. They know the nuances, and, and they know how to nuance it right out the window so that they don't have responsibility for, for it anymore. You know, it reminds me, you see, what's going to happen is God says to Isaiah, you're going to go proclaim the truth and the truth itself is going to harden my people because of the darkness of their heart. Now, it reminds me of my days before Jesus. I was in a dark place. And all you had to say to me was a word like righteousness or holiness or sanctification or sin. 
tell me a little story about somebody who was like that, and that was enough, that would have been enough to make me laugh. It was a joke just hearing the words, just hearing the concepts. This is where the devil had me in my darkness, that the, the very truth served to, to harden my heart more. And this is where God's people are, the people he gave his life for, the people he was going to send his son for, the people he's been hanging on to. Uh, he's going to proclaim the truth. And he says, Isaiah, you're going to enter into my heart. You're going to feel the pain I feel when I talk to my people and they, they just hate me. They're like the birds that fly in every direction. They want the gravy train, but they don't want me. And so this smallish step I'm talking about as a way forward is the simple step of believing God's word and obeying it, trusting him. John Calvin said this, our true wisdom is to embrace with meek docility and without reservation whatever the Holy Scriptures have delivered. Now, Calvin is not saying that we come to the Bible like simpletons and we check our brain at the door. The Bible can be complex, and we have to think it through. But what he is saying is there is a simple word from God that comes up through the Scriptures, and it falls to us to listen to it and to submit to it not to cleverly nuance it around or say to God, well, I know I believe most of what you say, but Lord, at this point, I'm just going to believe what I want because ultimately you're, you're just on the side of my life. No, we say, with meek docility, hineni, here, here am I. And if we want a revelation of God, an ongoing revelation of God, I think that's just a beautiful, wonderful, small step to stake forward take forward. I'd like to invite the band to come forward, and I'd like to respond to this as we did in the congregational prayer. I'd like to give us each a chance to respond in our own hearts to what's going on in this text. Maybe some of us need to be like Chuck Colson. Some of you remember Chuck Colson, this very powerful figure in the Nixon administration, Nixon's hatchet man. He could get it done in Washington, and then he, he came to Jesus after being thrown in prison, it took that, but he, 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 he came to Jesus and he became a fireball for Jesus. But after three years, during a dry period, he studied, he did a study, you know, a, a certain teacher brought him through a study of Isaiah 6. And when he was done with it, he got on his knees and he confessed to God that his view of God had been utterly inadequate. He repented of the superficial view he had with God, the, the, the place that he occupied, and that God occupied in his thinking, and that he thought he occupied in the world relative to God. And so maybe some of us need to just do that. We, we need to just repent with our hearts. And if you want to get on your knees, you can do that. But other of us may just want to say, God, here I am, in the simplicity of my being. And... I'll leave that up to you, but I, I do will tell you this, that you get that right, we get that right, and everything changes about how we think how our problems. We, we come to a place where we could even endure our problems. If this is what God wills, maybe he'll change them. But if he doesn't, we'll live with that because we serve such an incredible God. And he'll be there and he'll be adequate for us. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we come before your majesty, your holiness, your extraordinary being. And God, please do what no words could possibly do. By your spirit, reveal to us who you are. And grant that we could have a self-quake that would, would change the most important thing there is to change, and that is our understanding of who you are. Lord, hear each one of us as we speak in the quiet of our hearts to you now.
Come, Lord. Lord, I said it and I'm going to say it again. You are not the problem in our relationship with you. The blockage is always on our part. And so we pray in your mercy, give us a vision like you gave Isaiah and draw us close to you so that we can live in the joy and the peace of truly knowing you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't we all stand as we sing this song in response?
I, boy, I didn't want that to end, ever. <laughs> that was just wonderful. Well, if you're here today and you haven't done this, and maybe it's your very first time here, we have a gift for you at the welcome desk in the foyer. Why don't you go by and pick it up, and you can leave your name there if you'd like, and uh, we can follow up with you and, and start a connection, um, or at least get more information about Maranatha Church. We'll be having coffee out in the fellowship hall and in the hub. And if you need prayer, there will be people right on hand here at the bottom of the platform in front of the, the keyboard. Now, as we draw this service to a close, I want to read these words that come from the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, where it says, To him who loves us, and freed us by our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him and even those who pierced him and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. Oh, we, we could explore that text. It's going to be glorious and sad uh, for some. Um, God says we're, we're a kingdom. Through his power, we go and we, we, we bring his great rule to our workplaces, to our communities, our families. And we're priests. We stand between God and, and, and the people around us to speak his, his good news. Um, some churches, as you walk out the door, they'll say, welcome to your mission field. Or I've heard it said, the church service is over, now church begins. Now we are the church gathered, but church goes on all week. And so I just want to say on God's behalf, go in the knowledge of the God who loves you, who has extended his arms to you, and who will walk with you every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.